as my guest said a uh, while ago, <laughs> some minutes ago, <laughs> a good story, good storytelling. It's a nice way to build trust and to get closer to people. If you want to learn more about this topic, how you can embrace storytelling, how you can choose the right story or stories to start your storytelling, you should tune in and stay there because we will gonna talk about it. See you in a moment. Okay. Okay, we have some problems here. Oh my God. Let's see if Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the first episode of the sixth season of the special marketing live show. And what a good way to start with, with Daniel and talking about storytelling. Today, we're going to discuss how we can use it, um, storytelling, which story we can pick to make a great storytelling and uh, how the things we should take care when we are uh, thinking about this, how we can uh, frame the process and everything. So let me see if Daniel is there. I left, as usual, I left him on the basement. <laughs> Hello, Daniel, how are you? Hey, hey Mark. <laughs> well, I have some issues here, but I think I fixed them. Hello, hello. Hello, everyone who was, who are watching us, please let us know where are you watching us, uh, if it's Facebook, YouTube, or LinkedIn, and from where you are watching, uh, where are you located? Hello, Chris. Hello. Hello, Miguel. How are you? So, Daniel. Yeah. Thank you for joining me again. Okay. It's a pleasure to yeah. have you on the show, uh, talking about this so important topic. If you don't mind, introduce yourself, and then let's go to the conversation. Right. Okay. So my name is Daniel, or Danny Alegi, and um, I'm a filmmaker, and I'm an author, entrepreneur, imagineer. I basically work with ideas and story development for both uh, content creators, filmmakers, writers, organizations, uh, and businesses. So my focus and my passion is how do you develop good story how do you create good storytelling and add value for your customers for your audiences and to your own content that's perfect well hola miguel bienvenido well daniel mm. you you told me about uh, wh while we were uh talking in the off screen in the basement. <laughs> you told me yeah <laughs> the basement you told me about the importance of building trust and how we can make it uh through uh, storytelling. Do you want to talk a little bit deeper about this situation, please? I don't know if I trust you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think that, you know, here, here's, here's a good place to start with this, right? Is that uh, people ask me all the time, what's the difference between story and storytelling? Okay, and so let's, let's say that story is something that starts and ends. Right, you, you create the story, there's a beginning, there's an end, there's a middle, and somehow it gets resolved. Some problems is, is solved uh, and we move on. But storytelling is actually a process. It's not something that you can say, you know, storytelling starts here and ends there. Because storytelling is really the way we think, the way we are. It's a way in which we associate raw data from our experience into something we can share with others and can connect us on a humanity level. So humanity requires trust. In other words, strangers that encounter, you know, that cross roads in the middle of a forest have a fairly cold trust level if they don't know each other. 
But once they sit around the, the campfire and, and warm their frozen feet and, 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 and share some food, they begin to build upon something. They begin to find elements of connections between their experience. Oh, where do you come from? Oh, I know someone from there. What have you studied? Oh, okay, I'm interested in this instead, right? The past, the experience, the vision for the future, the approach to the moment become elements of intersection, of different DNAs, of different storytelling points of view, right? And trust comes from that, especially if you're in a position where you have someone that says, I can assist you in your storytelling. I can help you in your story development. I can help you improve your story UX online. I can help you work on the experience that you want to get from an interactive audience. Well, that requires trust. And at the same time, it has as its only real objective to create trust. Right? So storytelling is not necessarily something that uh, you apply it like, uh, you know, like glue and it makes a sale automatically. It has a long term vision. It's like looking at the horizon together, talking about something that unites without ignoring the details, but without only wanting to convert the details immediately, like a story can do. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and the, the title of this uh, conversation, it's uh, what story uh, should I uh, tell? <laughs> or, uh, the titles matter. So, yeah, t absolutely. So the, I think we should begin with this uh, because uh, our, on our way, we have some stories that are good for us to connect with others and some who are not. <laughs> Uh, how, right. how should I start? Which one should I pick uh, to to make them uh, really impactful and to work uh, for me? Okay, well that that's a question that I get a lot too, right? And, and, and let me let me just start by saying that um, that story is not a whore. It's not someone that you that is not someone that you buy for pleasure. I uh, apologize for this metaphor, but what <laughs> I mean is, is that there is, there is a certain tendency to say, just add story and everything will work. Absolutely. Just add some story and you'll be fine. <laughs> and then that's why a lot of people face the, 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 the notion of, you know, what story do I tell? Which is sort of a, what happens next situation in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a larger plot. What happens next in terms of what story do we use next? What's the purpose of that story, right? So that if you treat story as something to manipulate, in other words, take a story that will provoke this reaction and we can use it for this specific purpose to cheat or convince others to follow something that will lead to our benefit and our profit. Right? That's not a path that I really recommend. What, what I encourage instead is to look for organic storytelling, something that comes from who you are, comes from your mission, and connects your, your highest ambition to, to fly with your idea or your project with the, the ground earth. Right? In other words, that you can dream thinking about gravity existing. Right, that you actually have both sides of the story coin in mind. Because the illusion of thinking that story is like a one-sided thing, we just slop it out there and it's like a commercial. It's a one-sided story. Just put it out there and you know promote a product. That's 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 advertising, that's traditional classical advertising. My product is better than yours, <laughs> and I'm just gonna say it and repeat it. But we don't live in TV era anymore. We live in interaction era. We live in places where everything you say, every action you make in media world provokes a reaction in the forms of comment, in the forms of word of mouth, 
in the form of even physical interaction, like somebody asking a question in the middle of an online stream. So storytelling is two-sided, whereas sometimes story can be one-dimensional. You can just tell a flat story and say, this is like it is, this is how it is. But in storytelling, you're always working with the bounce so that every light that you put out there creates a shadow. Everything cold you meet, you turn it to warm, right? So you're always working with a kind of yin yang of the opposites, right? You're aware that you're seeking rewards high up there, light, love, friendship. And at the same time, you're aware that the risk will take you down into defeat and loneliness and death. Right? So storytelling is including all stories. There is no story without storytelling, but you can have storytelling as an environment, a way of thinking about relationships that doesn't translate specifically all the time in a specific story. Now I can make make that even more clear by saying storytelling is really a process. It's a space. It's an environment within which you are welcoming the feedback of your audience. You're guiding your audience to learn and share your knowledge by existing in that same space with you. Right? So sometimes companies will say, you know, but we are so strong and so good and our product is, is great. <laughs> but the company and the product really are not the hero in a storytelling environment, right? The hero is the customer who is trying to get some benefit, some value from associating with this company or organization. So the value comes, again, from the interaction of these opposites, the mentor company who has the knowledge, the storyteller, and the listener, viewer, customer who will be onboarded into this storytelling customer experience environment. Absolutely. I'll give you a pop there so you can breathe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, because uh, uh, one of the things, uh, and uh, this could be, uh, yes, it is, it is a question for you. Usually, we we tend to 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 hear, okay, use your customer as the hero on your um, on your story, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, tell us how you help it, a uh, customer to overcome a problem with your product, with your service. Um, but if I'm starting, I didn't have any customer yet. Right. How can I embrace this? How can I manage this situation to, um, to I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to say fake uh, a hero on the story or uh, uh, the, the main character, but how can we overcome this situation? Because we don't have any experience. We didn't uh, save nobody in troubles. How can we overcome this? Well, the thing you have, even if you have no success story yet, is your passion. You're doing something because you love it. You're doing something because you have knowledge in it, right? So that really is the starting point of trust, is to see this person talking to me actually is passionate about what he's talking about. Marco Novo is passionate about streaming as a form of empowerment, as a form of presence in the market, even for small size businesses, right? I see that. So therefore, I listen. And listening is step one in storytelling for both the audience and the teller. The teller listens to what the audience needs, right? So that the knowledge of the storyteller can in some point intersect the needs of the audience. 
I might be talking about storytelling. There might be somebody out in the audience that has a specific business, say, growing roses in Portugal. I don't have any specific knowledge in working with uh, growing roses. But we might have together the experience, for example, of running a family business or of having just transitioned from one industry to another or in having a background in technology, right? So you have a little bit of an overlap. You know how in the MasterCard logo, you have the two circles that have that little overlap? Well, that's the little overlap between the world of the customer and the world of the mentor, the world of the consultant, the, 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 the knowledge place. And they intersect perhaps for a very small part. And in that part, you find a conversation. Right. And all storytelling starts from a conversation. Right? It starts from basically listening, sharing and opening. Opening with one another about, you know, humanity. I realize this momentarily might sound like some sort of preacher uh, in, in, <laughs> in, 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 in a country parish. Right. But what I mean is that we are very automated. A lot of our storytelling is big data driven. So we're thrown in a big soup. We are interpreted through our actions and our choices, and we're marketed to at a big data level. Storytelling, it can interpret big data, right? I mean, big data is part of industrial storytelling. But at the same time, it also wants to connect with the local dimension with the personal dimension of individuals, conversation. That's why companies that do a lot of uh, telephone customer service, a lot of very careful onboarding, learn so much about their customers and, and develop a faithful following. Companies get a lot of love from people that they talk to. So it's, it's as simple as, Talk to your customers and listen to what they say. Now, to go back to your question, that in itself is the beginning of a story, right? So if you look at you know the, the, the Zappos company years ago, before they sold to Amazon, they only had one story, and that is that their customer service spoke to any customer for as long as they wanted on the phone. Right. There was jokes of people calling Zappos and being on the phone for hours asking, you know, kind of questions you would ask to a shrink. <laughs> but this word of mouth actually went around the world. That this company was a customer experience company. Right. So that your story can basically start from the point in which your passion meets a customer's request for help, right? So like help, like in the Beatles album, if anybody remembers, help, question, uh, exclamation mark, right? Because any story that you will tell, whether it's drama, fiction, or some kind of explanation PowerPoint story, centers around someone asking for help and someone else being open to offering that help. That can mean, for example, I need help setting up a streaming show. I don't know what equipment I need to use, right? So there you have the beginning of a conversation that can be, you know, an automated list of equipment purchases, or it can be a series of YouTube videos that explain the process, or a combination of the two, right? So from a request for help comes a relationship. A relationship with a storyteller, a guide, a mentor who is willing to help. That in itself is a story to begin with. Okay, so let, let me tell you like a, a little short story about about something that happened to me. Uh, I think in 1994, right? That kind of dates me a little bit. Uh, and I was living in, in in Italy, 
And uh, I had uh, just come back from Los Angeles, worked on a, a Disney film, and I was you know, looking to help some young Italian writers uh, get some scripts read uh, in Los Angeles. So I, I put an ad in a newspaper back in the day. That was sort of the equivalent of, of Google. We still didn't have, we had a very sort of cheap modem at the time. But so I, I got a, a script delivered to my house by mail. And I read the script and there was a love story. And I sent back a bunch of notes. And this was all done for the, the, the passion of trying to move a script along. So lo and behold, this script eventually won a prize at a, uh, at a competition for love stories. And I got a lot of word of mouth, right? So people came to me saying, oh, you're, you helped my friend. Can you help me more, et cetera? <laughs> so that in some kind of way that seems always easy to tell after it's happened, but the reality is, is you have to have the courage to get into your own business and the storytelling associated with your business for the love of it, for the passion of it, right? Because if someone were to do a streaming show only because they had 100,000 viewers, that would be too easy. What's interesting is to watch you know, passionate people hold on to their streams before they get the numbers, right? And, and, and offer that kind of consistent storytelling, bringing interesting guests to the show to establish a relationship of trust. People come to you uh, because they know that you care for them, right? And that is essentially the core dynamic value of storytelling. The creation of trust based relationships as a customer steps forward through a narrative environment. Now, what do I mean by narrative environment? I mean that everything we do becomes a story the minute we tell somebody else about it, right? Because you, you, you go, you, you, you meet somebody, then you go home and you say, oh, I met someone. Where did you meet them? Oh, I met them in town. What were you doing? Oh, I was there uh, picking up my shoes at the, at, the, at, the, at the shoe store. Oh, who was it? Oh, it was a person who was just visiting here for, for 10 days, and now with COVID, they're, they're stuck here. Oh, and what do they do, et cetera? So it's obvious, right, that storytelling is nothing but who we are, how we think how we share, how we experience. Now, if you put it in a business perspective, let me start from this very simple thing. Do you want to ask another question or should I keep? Uh... No, 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 keep, keep, keep going, keep going, <laughs> listen. <laughs> no. no, because to put it in, in the simplest terms, right? And, and I know that this is a world today where people like simple, right? We don't have time to read a lot. Uh, and sometimes simple even goes to the detriment of depth. Like we just don't have any interest in going below the surface of something. A, because people only look at the Instagram pictures <laughs> every now and then. And because, you know, reading 200 pages of a novel to get some sort of hidden meaning, for some people just doesn't seem modern enough fast enough, efficient enough, right? So I am in favor of simplifying storytelling structures, but I'm also in favor of digging deep for meaning, for actually looking for something that you're interested in developing. So I'm interested in clarity, that the result of a story is clear, that it can help, but not in surface. In other words, not only in pleasing others, right? And this is a little bit of a, a, a crisis point because I work both with dr dramatic writers as well as with companies who are trying to promote themselves, right? So when you're talking about drama, you're not saying everything. You're leaving a lot of information in the shadows. You're leaving a lot of openings for an audience to go digging for 
personal associations, a personal meaning. But when you're working in what I call explan mode, which is I'm just going to tell you everything how it is, I'm going to transfer my knowledge to you, right, in a PowerPoint, say, for example, where it's going to be linear. I'm just going to give you the, the material. So you have, you know, a, a sort of a minor dramatic impact. There's going to be nothing left unexplained at the end of a PowerPoint, whereas there might be in a piece of theater or in a cinematic story, in a film, for example. So the, the simplest way for me to, to encourage your jump into storytelling, uh, which you, you're welcome to visit my uh, website, cinemahead.com, or my story design app, uh, scriptonite.app, uh, for a little bit more information. But the basic, basic, basic uh, way to look at it for me is to think of it as a compass, which is really the title of of today's uh, chat here. And what I mean by compass is the fact that it's really disorienting to think, oh, I have to tell a story. I have a product, but I don't have a story. What story do I tell? And if you look around, there's just a lot of stories floating around. You know, if you even get near to the world of politics, then you get into questions about what's real, what's not real, what's fake, what's not fake, right? It's, it's very disorienting to encounter the crossroads between fact and fiction these days. It, it's, a, it's a pretty scary place. I think they've actually ripped out the signs. Like you don't really know which one is which, <laughs> right? You just, you just gotta go into the forest, you know, a little red riding hood, just keep going and you're really <laughs> not gonna get any indications. Right, so you have to find your connection to some kind of truth, and you have to put it in relation to your point of view, your mission, and where you're coming from. So, if you think of it as a compass, think of it as basically something where you're moving towards something in the future which you will move for whether you do anything actively or not. You're, 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 you're sort of on a, on, a, you know, on a sort of a moving surface that will continuously give you the impression of moving forwards towards something which will go neither up nor down unless you try to make it do that, right? So to try to have an up future means to try and act upon your interests, your desires, your self-interest to act upon it, to try to make it happen, right? So that's, that's your compass. You're looking, to, you're looking to the future and you're looking at the big picture. You focus on something, an objective that you want to reach. You try to take a step towards it, right? And as long as the step forward is flat, nothing happens, you have no conflicts, no obstacles, then you just keep going. Because you know, we're lazy creatures, you know. If 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 nothing stops us, we're just going to keep tiptoeing forward, like it's fine, All right? But then something probably will happen because, you know, we we live in a world that is material, so there is friction. We we will have obstacles. There is going to be something there to stop us. Something will be heavy. Something will be far. Something will be difficult. Right? And. And upon those obstacles, we will need to make some choices. How much does it mean to me to overcome this problem? So you're doing a streaming show, Mark. I'm going to use you here as the, as the hero of the story. <laughs> you're making a streaming show, and in the middle of the streaming show, everything freezes. You know, I you know what you're yourself, talking about. <laughs> you find yourself... <laughs> and you find yourself... With a frozen screen for 10 minutes, you lose all your viewers, but you continue to work to get it back because you want to have a complete show, all right? The other opportunity, the other option is to simply give up, all right? So giving up would be falling down in a compass. If you're looking at this imaginary compass, you're looking at a bit like a like a watch, 
right? So we're perhaps three o'clock, if we're talking about an old analog watch, would be going forward, and, uh, and six o'clock would be falling down, would be giving up, and 12 o'clock up would be achieving what you want. If we could achieve what we want immediately, we would be jumping up to the roof. Every human ambition that's ever been narrated has to do with height. Success is height, right? If you live on the uh, 98th floor, like <laughs> Donald Trump, you know, then then that's a representation of success. Absolutely. Right? If you're if you are Icarus and you want to fly towards the sun, <laughs> well, you know, you're looking to to rise because that is the measure of your success. You know, and then you have a little sort of surprise ending there. The more you rise, the more you risk falling. Right? So that the ultimate most exciting stories we can have, sometimes not applicable in business, but in, in drama, are those that have life and death stakes. Right? If you if the hero succeeds, if the customer gets full satisfaction. They, their life is changed. If, on the contrary, they not, they fail trying, well, then they risk everything they have. They even might self-sacrifice for the good of others. The important thing is that a story in a compass format that looks at what we want right away, ideally, what we risk to lose, moving forward and encountering obstacles, and coming from a past where we learned, went to school, had experiences, had dreams as kids, all that in the past, memories, the kind of a rewind mode that we have back there. But the fundamental moment that we're all in as storytellers, and I don't want to sound too zen here, it's the center of the compass is the now is the moment, it's the carpe diem, it's the, it's the day. It's the moment in which you have that choice, take action or don't take action. Shall we do this as a company or not do it, right? Not do it, in other words, inaction, basically gives up on storytelling. Because if you choose inaction, you never trans transform a thought into reality. You never transform a psychology into a behavior. Because that is storytelling, is the transformation of psychology into behavior, of wishing into reality. Absolutely. I'm frozen. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you're not frozen. Okay. It's it's yeah yeah it's it's really important about this consistency and uh, and I have a question if right before sure. let me fall in comments Chris saying I think that storytelling is very important because people can find a solution to their problems in it can interact and remember stories better. Any thoughts on this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. Hi Chris. Yeah I. I, I agree. I mean, I think that basically we are engineered. You know, our DNA is a weave of different elements, right? That storytelling activates so that when we find a relationship that is uh, with organizations, with, with, with businesses, or even with, with movies, in other words, something that is produced, something that is made for us, but we can recognize in it the simple elements of storytelling that we recognize in ourselves. That's a great point of contact. That's why storytelling is the organic way for people to connect among each other and also with organizations, right? So the problem solving that Chris is talking about is what we are used to in our own life. We're all experts problem solvers. We've always solved every problem we faced. And if we didn't solve a specific problem, you know, like they don't have my shoe size in that store, well, we probably solved it later. In other words, we good, 
we we got a good experience from the process of engaging with problem solving. So storytelling is, in, in fact, a bubble, a container of problem solving efforts that humans normally take and that are easily applicable and transferable to the world of uh, customer service or any kind of customer experience. Absolutely. Okay. And, and that, that, that comes to, <laughs> to my question. You, you talked about word of mouth, which is a, a, a very known um, way to spread the word. But the problem is it's not, um, I think, uh, Two problems. First one is that you don't give the, maybe sometimes because uh, you think the word of mouth, it's only uh, about customers. You don't give them the right story to tell, to spread. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and the other one, it's uh, by it's, um, it, because you don't say the, the, you don't give the right story for your customers to to tell because you don't uh, put the things in a clear way, in a consistent way. It allows, it gives the freedom to your customers to spread uh, sometimes um, not that accurate a story about you and your service or your company or, or your product. How do you think we can overcome this? Right. Well, I think this goes right back to the issue of trust. In other words, you cannot manipulate trust. In other words, if you want word of mouth, which is the cheapest form of storytelling advertising, then you have to take the risk that people will be freely commenting on your services. Right. So you cannot tell people, oh, yeah, talk about my company and talk nicely about it. <laughs> Absolutely. Right, because people will actually convey their experience. So word of mouth, which is clearly the most powerful, contagious form of storytelling. Because if I see a movie that I love, the first person I see, I will say, hey, have you seen that movie? Yeah, right? And for I mean, when you love something, you tell somebody about it. Yeah, absolutely. That is the principle of social media. Right, We function in social media because we love to appear to others that we can actually post cool stuff that they will like. Absolutely. So you see something interesting, you know, the baby elephant, you know, the panda <laughs> was born in San Diego, and, and you post it because you think, oh, people are going to really appreciate the fact that I found this information. Right? So we, we're also kind of engineered for that uh, sort of adrenaline pleasure rush that comes when you look at an Instagram post and say, wow, 500 people put hearts on it. You know, I mean, there's something, there's something that we as humans really want, which is the love of others. And if it comes in this sort of digital miniature form on a phone, I guess we'll have to settle for that. <laughs> So I think, as I said, I think it's 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 a two-sided coin. I mean, word of mouth is 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 I think everybody's wish is to be loved by people who are evangelists for your company, right? For example, I like Apple computer. I know a lot of other people like Apple, uh, you know, because they've always used it because it's easy, blah blah blah. And you know, I have done so much advertising for Apple, you know, unpaid. Convincing Absolutely. people, even when I used to work for IBM, I used to advertise that. Uh, but, you know, it's because you have something you're really passionate about. And so you're an evangelist. You preach it. Right. I mean, uh, I think that's what you do with, with your work and with streaming. It's what I do with storytelling and script writing and screenplay and story and film is I think that there is a form of empowerment in engaging in the storytelling stream, right? Because the thing is this, in the abstract, say you listen to this chat and then you then it's over 
And you say, oh, that Daniel guy, you know, he talked about a lot of stuff, but it was complicated. There was just a lot going on. And I didn't know exactly, you know, what he was doing. And I haven't read his book and I haven't seen his ebooks. I, I you know, a lot of confusion because, because it's not simple. Right. So in, in, imagine this, right? A story as a, a stone tossed into a, a lake that makes a little ripple, a little ripple that makes you want to write a nice Japanese haiku that says, stone in the water, the seasons are changing, tomorrow's another day. <laughs> right? Medieval Japanese haiku about a peaceful moment with loose time, where time is measured in seasons. Very easy, light, big. Right, so if, when you want to activate the story beyond the contemplation, yeah, beyond just contemplating something that's happening, you know, ripples growing on the water, you take away this easy time, you put it under pressure, you make it urgent. Suddenly you jump into the, the water and it's a white water river where you're dragged down through the rocks with or without a kayak all the way down in and out of the water, risking your life. Now you're no longer in haiku territory. You're no longer meditating. You're in action. Because you're experiencing story at the speed of the story itself. You're in the waves. You're moving through the rocks. So you have to accept there's a difference between talking about story and contemplating still water and a stone and a ripple and jumping into a white water river and struggling to survive, right? So one of the aspects of generating storytelling is to imagine a scenario in which there is not all the time in the world. Now, luckily, we live on a planet that doesn't have all the time in the world. So it's not that difficult to imagine. <laughs> It's a pretty standard thing. We really don't have all the time in the world. We're kind of in a hurry to get a bunch of stuff done. That's why a lot of companies include sustainability in their storytelling. In other words, they include their efforts within a wider range of efforts to be good to the planet in developing solutions. Right. So if you imagine your story not told in the comfort of the quiet lakeside with the Japanese haiku, but in the rush of urgency and danger of the reality of the choices you make, you will find yourself using your storytelling compass that we mentioned before, right? Your interest, the risk, your forward ambition, and your past and the now in the middle. When you're in action, your now is a very active place. You're making some choices. You cannot let the river smash you against the rocks. But if you're just watching a stone making ripples in a still lake, you don't really have to do much. You can be a viewer. You can be a follower. You can be a person who clicks like, like, like passively and never takes action. Right. So if you open up a little bit to this dimension of understanding storytelling as a way to spark a live action based interaction between you and your customer base. You have already not only started your storytelling, but now you have a story to tell. Because that what you did. So the next blog post that you will that you will create will be about how you started to use storytelling to look at the relationship between you and your audience differently. Because that is what you're doing. You're posting content online. You're linking that to social media. You're taking people to come and look at time and time again what content you're creating. A lot of people have companies doing this for them you know, writing posts and generating content. Because storytelling has this sort of egg and eggshell situation, right? <laughs>
you want to have an egg, right? That's your campaign, but you want to make sure that there's something inside the egg that's edible, that's nutritious, that's 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 useful. Absolutely. And not everybody is an egg maker, right? <laughs> yeah. But but yeah, so so what what happens is that this depends a little bit on what kind of company you are, how many people you have, how much time you have to actually start to think about storytelling as a way to connect with and engage with your customers that is radically different from one-way connectivity that you had before, from pure advertising, right? So that you can open yourself a little bit to the experience of others with your help and to your experience in listening to their needs and to go hand in hand documenting your experience. So that's one place some companies start from. To answer your question. Okay, yes, yes, yes. I, I was thinking about this uh, this thing. You, you should not uh, just uh, create stories by creating stories. Uh, storytelling is not about just uh, saying some story, but uh, creating a context for people to do something that you want them to do. Does it make uh, sense? Yeah, yeah, it, it does. <laughs> it, it does. Even though, I, again, I, I'd like to, I'd like to put a little bit of, mo of a monkey wrench in that, in that, in that wheel. Okay. <laughs> because, because if you only want customers to do what you want them to do, you will be dissatisfied if they do something different. But if you allow the viewer, the customer, the follower to have a, an individual reaction, a personal reaction, in other words, if you widen the horizon, right, then, then that person might have a reaction that is not exactly what you want, but it still makes them your friend. So it's like if, if you sit you know, by the beach and you look at the, at the, at the sunset, It's pretty easy for two people to say, ooh, what a beautiful sunset. There's not a lot of disagreement. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because, because the, the, the objective is so wide. But if you look at a specific target, a specific thing, you know, and you say, oh, I just looked at that sparrow fly by, and the other one says, oh, that wasn't a sparrow, that was a falcon. No, it was a sparrow. <laughs> I'm telling you, didn't you see the, the, the wings? That's a falcon. So the more specific you get, the more disagreement you get. So I, I think that in, in a way in film, uh, we, we have a similar situation, right? Where you have Steven Spielberg who makes a film and says, I want to know exactly what my audience is feeling at every minute. It's a very powerful statement to say, I want to control You know, this is a, uh, it's a Hitchcock approach. It says, I want to be able to control, determine, manipulate, manage the emotions of an audience every frame of this film. Then you have other filmmakers, you know, maybe auteurs from France or Russia or Poland or Portugal or Italy who leave a lot of choice. In other words, you watch the movie and you come out feeling this, feeling that. I liked it. I didn't like it. Or oh, that character was funny, but that part wasn't good. And the plot's not so tight. And you have a different approach that doesn't aim at a specific result, but wants to generate a kind of general feeling of appreciation. Right? So to you, storytelling doesn't necessarily mean that you need to get the same exact reaction from everybody. And that's why it's so important to, to use what I call story data, which is you know, basically an understanding of your audience, an understanding of what your audience is doing. If you're not a company that has access to massive uh, uh, data storage that you can read everything your, 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 your <laughs> users are doing, Uh, small companies, it's good to know your customers. It's good to talk to them. It's good to get a feeling 
for what people like. I like to use questionnaires. I like to ask people questionnaires with, with nice interactive uh, questionnaires with images and, 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 uh, and movies and ask people questions about them and, and get their responses about what they prefer and what they would like to see or would not like to see. Actually, there is one on the cinemahead.com site. There's a questionnaire that I use as an onboarding questionnaire to see if people are interested in film or if they're working in companies, if they're interested in screenplay design or in storytelling for an organization so that I can uh, also uh, make sure that people get the right newsletters. Um, so I, I think it's, it's good to leave people open to be looking in the same general direction, but to have open reactions and not think of you as a cowboy trying to push you know, 5,000 cows through the big red river. Because I, I, I don't see business like that. Perfect, perfect. Well, we have uh, this question from Chris. <laughs> it came in, in, the same, in the same array. <laughs> uh, please, is there a good way to tell your story so that it keeps people interested? and they will respond to your call to action. I think it's a compliment for what we were uh, talking about. Yeah, I think um, if you're talking about a, like a cinematic story, in other words, something that is a video, for example, if you're talking about, this is how I'm interpreting your question, tell a story as in making a cinematic story, something that will appear uh, uh, with, with action and movement, et cetera, uh, I think, Example is, is very inspiring. In other words, to, uh, to use action as a form of example, as a form of inspiration, right? That I, I would like to do that as well. Because I think story is a great example, right? When we tell stories of people we admire, that story itself becomes an example. Okay, for example, I've always been an admirer of uh, Nelson Mandela. Uh, my son's name is Nelson. <laughs> and and I have always considered basically, um, you know, his life uh, an example of the kind of anti-fragility, right? In other words, the ability to resist robustly and to transform through conflict, through suffering, right? Spending 27 years in prison and then coming out guided by a principle of reconciliation, right? So I think that um, if you want to use a story directly, in other words, make a film, make a video, make a, uh, a cinematic, storytelling example, uh, I would suggest uh, trying to do that, trying to create a, a little scenario in which we, the viewers, would like to imitate, would like to be like that person or people. That's great. <laughs> I'm, answering, I'm, I'm answering based on the assumption that, that, that Chris was talking about uh, in creating a video or a shoot uh, in the, in that sense. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we are almost coming to, to the end. <laughs> so maybe it's good to make a kind of a wrap about uh, yeah. basic ideas to, to choose the, the right story, how to put things together. Uh, what do you think, Dania? That would be the ending. <laughs> that would be the ending uh, and and uh, you know surprisingly to a lot of people that that talk to me for the first time the ending is where storytelling begins in other words you, you sort of have to know how your story ends in order to be able to time it and to plan it and to develop it uh, in a way that works Right. So that if you're if you're thinking about a story, don't worry too much about how the story is going to begin. Think mostly about how it's going to end. 
right? Is it going to end with getting what this character wants? Or is it going to end with the character not getting what they want? Or perhaps some form of both? Once you've figured out how the story ends, then you can easily backtrack to the beginning because now you know the road to travel. Right. So the important thing, I think, in all storytelling is to think of the purpose, the scope, the reward that is going to be at the end of that story. Because a story ultimately will give you rewards, rewards that will be in the dimension of, you know, if it's drama, it will be love, it will be light, it will be inspiration, it will be solutions, it will be resolutions. And if it's in the world of organizations and business and, 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 and organizational relationships, the rewards will be value and fidelity and word of mouth and positivity and brand identity spread. Because the experience of the story that got you there is what you will carry now associated with that brand. And then you can backtrack to the beginning. In other words, you can start a story whenever you want once you know how it's going to end. Right? I've worked with a lot of storytellers who tried the opposite. I have an idea. I'm going to start from page one. I'm going to try to work my way through and then figure out how it goes and then find some kind of ending. <laughs> That's like trying to cross a little rope bridge while you build it. Right? That's why on my website, the, the image on the front is a little rope bridge. Because you have to build the bridge first. You throw the rope to the other side, you secure it, and then you build it any way you want. You want to put more rope, you put wood, whatever you need. But you fastened it to the opposite side. So you need to know what you're going to hang your story onto on the other end before you start to make it pretty. Okay. And in fact, um, there's a wonderful documentary from the 70s in the US called The Aristocrats. Um, I'll stop here, Mark, after this. But, but, <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, it, where basically a, a number of comedians were asked to invent the middle of a story that they were given the beginning and the ending for. So the ending and the beginning were the same, and then each of them could invent the middle of it as a stand-up comedy show. Which really goes to the point that if you have a solid ending and you have a, a, a beginning that captures, that hooks, then you can pretty much do whatever you want in the middle. You can create more storylines, you can add more characters if we're in drama, and if we are in the world of customer relations, well, the middle is the relations that you have with the customer, the contacts, the connections, the campaigns, the feedbacks, the questionnaires. Right. So, so the ending is really the best place to start. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Nice way to, to end, <laughs> of course. Mm -hmm. Well, but uh, for those of you who are watching us, please stay tuned because um, not that uh, far from, from now, Daniel will be back with some good news. So please pay attention to my feed because <laughs> we will get, bring you some news. Crazy say, she's saying super interesting show. Thank you so much, Danny and Mark. You're welcome. Thank you, Chris, for staying there, watching us. It's it's a pleasure to please you so much. Well, Daniel, thank you so much. We came yeah. to the <laughs> it, it it went fast, and um, yeah. please let people know where they can find you, please. Um, I'm at cinemahead.com, or you can find uh, my latest events at uh, danielleggi.com. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. And all the Twitter and Cinema Head, all those links are all there. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much, Daniels. We will see you back soon. I have to come up with some surprise now. <laughs> and thank you so much for all of you who were uh, watching us, our show. We, I will be back in uh, within one hour. <laughs> talking about epic understanding and how we can embrace diversity. And uh, so please stay there, <laughs> grab some water and eat something. And 
Uh, we'll be back within one hour. See you. See you there. Bye-bye.